loving us. Thank you that you love us and that you care for us and that you have come to bring us joy. Thank you that you will speak through me tonight in a powerful way to the point that every person here will just be deeply encouraged by the love that you have for them. And may each one of us just experience more of your love and just understand the depth the length, the width, the height, and just the whole dimension of your goodness, and we can experience your fullness in our hearts. Thank you for that, Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to move this chair quickly. Right. Um, tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, forgiveness and just what forgiveness is and how for forgiveness takes place. Um, I would also like to define forgiveness from a perspective and just <clears throat> how God, you know, uh, looks at forgiveness. Because God's definition of things is the only correct definition, isn't it? I mean, we can, we can make up our definitions of forgiveness and mercy and kindness and grace. Um, and then you get God's definition. Like, for instance, the word mercy. Uh, we have taken the word mercy and we've defined it inside law parameters where we define mercy as overlooking a sin. But if you go and look at what the word mercy means in the original, it actually means to bow your head or to honor an equal, which is completely different than what we thought. And what we have seen is, you know, if God, when God was merciful to man, He actually acknowledged that man in his sinful state and in the bondage that he was in, he still um, in his image and in his likeness and his kind. And the way he did that was he became a man and uh, 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 brought life to man and took a man and put him in the Trinity. And that is how he basically bows the head or come in acknowledgement of equality, you know, uh, wherein we have long ago, you know, in the law system forgotten what the word mercy means. God comes and he gives true definition to mercy. The word grace, for instance, the word grace, we've seen grace as um, an unmerited favor, like the Amplified Bible says, for instance, or we've seen, you know, unmerited, meaning there's no merit for the favor. That is a law definition. That definition cannot stand its ground inside family relationship, you know, because is there no merit that I show my son favor? You know, we are the children of God, you know, so it can't be unmerited. It is merited. There's a lot of merit in showing favor to your son. It's a, there's a lot of merit in saving your son from death, you know, um, wherein the true me meaning of grace is actually that which affords joy in a person or um, it's an influence upon the heart through goodness that empowers, you know, completely something, it's completely different. If we look at definitions, we need, a, we need a look at the Trinity and what God's definition about something would have been even before time. Because then it's in its original uh, um, way of looking at it. And then we're going to look at forgiveness that way today. Now, before we, uh, or let me put it this way, forgiveness was such an important part of, or it's such an important thing in the heart of God, because God was bearing, His heart was in distress. God was going, and you might say it is impossible to, to believe that, but let me tell you, God was going through a difficult time when his friend, Adam, was lost. It wasn't easy for God. He didn't take it as an easy, light thing. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a case of, um, you know, my, 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 my friend, Adam, has sinned against me, or actually my slave, Adam, has sinned against me, and I need to punish him, and um, I just can't wait to, to get him, and, but I'm also good on the one side, so I'm going to try and work out something. I've got this conundrum because I'm good and I'm angry and I don't know how to, to fix this thing. I want to tell you there was anguish in the heart of God. Um, when God came to Adam and He said to Adam, Adam, where are you? I, I don't think it was a play. It wasn't as if God didn't know where He was. I see Adam, where are you? As a, as a husband and a wife that have always just loved each other and was was going so well and what, whatever. And then one of the two, let's say, um, let's say the guy, his name is Adam, he's, he had an affair. And uh, he, he 
well, start a relationship with another lady and, and Adam would come home and then his wife would sit at the dinner table and they would laugh like normal or whatever and Adam would smile and but the smile would be plastic and as he starts to tell her story and, and you know of the day and how it went his mind would be in another place and, and she would say Adam where are you? You know you're not here anymore your mind is in, in another place where are you? You know, and then he actually finds himself in a place called fear and anguish and all those kind of things. And um, I, I believe from that perspective is, is where we need to approach the gospel, where we need to approach the salvation plan. Not from a plan where God was angry, where God had to deal with man's sin in the form of punishment, but actually a, from a place where there was anguish in the heart of God. And we read that in Psalm, uh, uh, in Isaiah 66 verse 1, it says, um, and I spoke to John about this over lunch. Uh, it says here, Thus says the Lord, The heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Now, now listen to what God is saying. He says, I dwell in the heavens and all the earth and the heavens is everything that I've made. I've got everything you would imagine that I can have. And then he goes on and he, say, and he says, Where is the house that you build unto me? Where is the place of my rest? So what I see here is God is coming and he says, the heavens, you know, I live in the heavens and I've created all the earth, but I am wanting a place of rest. Where is the place of my rest? Where is the place where I, where I will find true rest? And then it goes on and prophesies about Jesus Christ. It says, for all these things my hands have made and all... Um, and all those things have been, says the Lord. But this man will I look to, even to him that is poor and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word, which is Jesus. So what he's actually saying is he's saying, listen, I, I've, I, I've got heaven, I've got earth, but I don't have a place of rest. Because, and then he says, I'm looking for a place to dwell. I want, I want to actually be with my people. And I find that I don't have any place in their hearts. And I want to restore that. I want to come and cleanse my name. I want to sanctify my name. I want to come and, and restore man's view about me because they cannot allow me into their heart because the view they have of me, um, what they think and who they think I am is, is simply in, su in such a way that I, I cannot dwell with them. I cannot walk with them. I cannot come in the cool of the day and walk with them. God tried to walk with Adam in the cool of the day, um, you know, after he sinned, but Adam was afraid. And we know that in any relationship where there's intimacy, in any, any close relationship, family relationship, marital relationship, fear cannot be there. The moment fear is there, it is not of high quality. It is not a relationship. You know, if somebody on the other side of town is, a, uh, is afraid of me, that's okay. You know, because, but, but if my wife is afraid of me, if my children hide from me, how do we live? If I come home and I find my children hiding away from me, that I need to say, where are you? And he's hiding under his bed. How can I have a relationship with that person? I need to restore uh, the heart of that person. And this is what happened with Adam and Eve. Um, Adam uh, came to a place, Adam and Eve, and, and they were lied to. Eve was lied to. She was deceived. And here was Adam and his wife, Eve, was deceived and went into death. And I think, you know, he like felt, well, if she's in that, what am I going to do? I'm also going to go into that. You know, it's, and to me it's like a kind of a type of Christ, where God saw his man, his people in death, and where he said, I will incarnate their death. But the difference between him and Adam was he could raise them from the dead. You know, where Adam couldn't do that. Uh, so here, here are people that are lost, they are afraid, they are scared of the very one that loves them. And God, he's got the heavens and he's got the earth, but home to him was to dwell with his people. And he didn't have a home anymore. And that word rest there, I want to just read that to you. Uh, 
That word rest there also in the Hebrew means consolation. It means alleviation of misery or distress of mind, refreshment of mind or spirit. So what God is saying here is, um, who will give me a place where this pressure in my heart can be lifted from me? I've got this, this worry inside me. It might be not that God was worried in the sense of, his, I mean, God doesn't need a worry. If you understand what I'm saying. But we he's trying to speak family language here that we can understand what was in the heart of God when he when man went lost. When God looked at man and, and, and man was deceived and man entered into death, that was never what God dreamt for man. That was never his plan. God's plan for man was I will come. And we are a heavenly family, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I will take dust, I'll make it alive, and I will give them the very attributes that I have. I'll even give them the ability to multiply. I'll make them more than one. You know, because when we talk, we talk about God, we talk about Elohim. And those of you that have listened to my messages, you know that Elohim means more than one. Or it's the plural form of God. So God was in heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they were a family. And they said, you know, it's wonderful that we are a family. But imagine you living here in, before there was anything here in, in this area. And there was just one house with one family. I mean, what would you want? You would want another family <laughs> that you can visit with and fellowship with and that will have the same abilities as you so that you can share life together. You know, we even find that um, if, I, if I didn't have children, I will mix with people that don't have children. You know, because when I mix with people that do have kids, it's like, we don't really, we can communicate and talk, but we can, one of the things that makes up the greatest part of our life, you know, we can't really talk about that. Or you talk about people that are married they and kids. They will have friends with people that are married and have kids. That's the kind of thing. So God says, I want a family that is like me. A family where there's more than one, where, where relationship, where there's relationship, where there's multiplication, where there's all those kind of things. And they will live, have this life on account of my life in them. And I will be a heavenly family. And we will merge these. And we will come and fellowship together and, and be friends. And so live eternally. That was God's plan. God's plan was not when he had man to have somebody to work in his garden, to keep his garden beautiful, so that when the angels come and visit him, that at least the garden is looked after. That was not God's plan when it comes to, to man. God's plan with man was uh, friendship. So God says, I need uh, a comfort. I need um, alleviation of misery or distress of mind. Um, I need a place where I can rest. And what he's actually saying is, if I cannot be with man, I cannot find peace in my heart. Because my people are suffering and they are dying and I want to redeem them from what is, what is uh, 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 killing them. Now, if we look at forgiveness from that perspective, or the, the Greek word for forgiveness literally means to separate or to end a contract. That's what it means. Uh, it, it means to divorce. In other words, um, now please, you know, don't go home now and tell your wife I want to forgive you. <laughs> that is, that, that's not what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But the word forgive literally means divorce. It means to end, to send away. So, when God comes and when He thinks of forgiveness, He doesn't think of forgiveness as in, um, you know, if, if we take the literal Greek meaning of forgive, which means to divorce or to send away, God is not, the, the forgiveness cannot be defined as God forgiving us of our sins as in He's divorcing us or He's sending us away. We need to define it in the true context, which would be that God uh, ends the contract we have with death ends the relationship we have with that which destroys our lives. That's how we define forgiveness. And I'm going to look at that in, uh, um, in, in a deeper sense. Now, the example I'm going to use, I know you guys are in the south here, 
So, um, don't kill me for the example. You know, so, <laughs> imagine, imagine there's a guy in Africa, and he lives in the African bush, and he lives amongst the, the trees there, and he's got his little mud hut, he's uneducated, and uh, doesn't have much, but what he has is a mud hut, a piece of land that the king allows him to farm on, you know, and he lives a very simple life. And he's got, um, he's, he's got his wife and they have children and he's, he had a dream for this child. And the dream for the child was the child would also have a mud hut and just have what he has. And then um, that the child can also have like two, two you know, cattle and f five goats and just live off the land kind of a thing and maybe plow something, you know, not much, but that was the dream he had for the son. And the son started to grow up and um, at about the age of 16, 17, you know, he's, he can really start to have a, a wonderful conversation with him. The son can go with him and hunt and, you know, it's just wonderful. He's so happy. And he's, the dream that he had for his son is that one day when, they, uh, when the son is older, he can sit, sit under the tree and just smoke a peace pipe, you know, and uh, talk about the things in the day. And all of a sudden, a ship comes to the African coast. And from the ship comes people with guns. And they hunt this young boy. They don't care for the father, for he's older. But they want the young guy. And he's running away in the bush. And he's hiding, fearing for his life. And they catch him. They put him in a cage. They put him on a ship. And they take him to... America or to England and there legally they sell him to someone else and the slave owner took take this guy to work at his castle or at his farm or whatever and um, there he works for this guy and the father at home is distressed He's stressed out. His heart is not at rest. He will not rest until his son is restored. That is the thing. Now, if we take these two scenarios, we're going to first start with a slave owner. And we're going to define sin in this context. So if you take the slave owner, what would he define sin as in uh, uh, towards that slave. He would say, it's a sin that I pay $50 for this guy and he doesn't do his work. That'd be a sin. It is a sin that he is not obeying me. It's a sin that he doesn't honor me. It is a sin that he doesn't, um, you know, in the middle of the night is ready when I want to do something for he is my property. I paid for him. This is not against the law. It's perfectly righteous. It's a sin. But what would the father of this child define as sin? I think the father would, if, and now imagine, let's go a little bit more into this. Imagine the, 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 the slave owner gives this guy a job and he works him hard and this guy loses his temper and swears at the slave owner. Do you think that swearing or bitterness or hatred or cussing him out or, or uh, 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 fear or all those kind of things would, when the father looks at his son, not the slave owner, the father looks at the son, do you think that he's going to say, my son has said a swear word, I need to punish him? Would he even define that as a sin? He wouldn't even look at it. He wouldn't even care about that. The greatest care that would be in the heart of the father would be that my son is under so much stress that, he's, that, that, that the fear and the anguish in his heart brings forth a language that's not even part of him. It would be completely different. What we have done is we've taken salvation and we've tried to define it inside the parameters of slavery. 
That's what we've done. And we've said, you have sinned, therefore you need to be punished, and then you can be forgiven. You know what would be the worst thing that can happen in a case like that? Is if the slave thinks the slave owner is his father. Mm. Mm. That would destroy him. That is a definite death. That's, that slave would never even discover who he really is. He would never know what freedom is. Imagine he's, he's got children and his children gets born on that farm. Under that, what would that children know? My goodness, their lives are destroyed. Their lives are destroyed. And the true father is in Africa crying. And that is the picture we find in Isaiah 61. Is I've got all the fields here. I've got all the trees. I've got the mud huts. I've got the cattle. I've got everything. But I don't have rest. Because I cannot be with my son. And what is happening to my son is a sin. And that sin needs to be sent away. That contract between the slave owner and my son needs to end. Forgiveness needs to take place. Now think about all that. You know, we, we come with, with Jesus Christ and, and, you know, if I would come to a, a person that is a slave, that has really been enslaved for years and years and years and that was born in slavery, the only way wherein I would be able to define uh, uh, um, goodness or forgiveness would be in legal terms. You know what? It is as good as if you have never sinned. Or, you know, um, someone else took your punishment. You can now go free. I'll try and explain it in a way that can kind of make sense to him. You know, if I'm taken uh, captive by... Well, let me put it this way. If we listen to the Bible definition of forgiveness and what, what happened in Christ, which I'm going to explain in depth tonight. When we look at the Bible definition of stuff and, and family definition, which is inside the, the Godhead and the Trinity, when we look at that, we have to come to the place where we, um, when we see God coming and bringing forth this forgiveness, we must have the feeling of, I've come home now. And I want to explain that. If, if somebody kidnaps my child in Cape Town, and you, you, you've, you've, I think you've seen that movie Taken. Now imagine that takes place. Somebody kidnaps my child and takes him somewhere to be a kind of a slave somehow. And he's there. And he's in that slavery. Just like in the movie, you know, Taken, when the child sees the father pitch up there, that child knows that the father has not come for the purpose of bringing more laws and rules. He knows, I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going back to the place I came from. I'm not going to a place where I, you know, where w w I'm going to a place where what my father owns is mine. A place of peace and rest and protection. That's what the child will know. You know, if, if I'm taken captive and I see some um, soldiers from the USA come there, I'm thinking I'm going to the United States. You know, I'm not going home. They're going to take me to the US. And then when I'm in the US, then I'll have to ask them, okay, now what now? Obviously, they want to re reunite me, but there's a, there's a process wherein you will not even be sure yourself. You know, what's going on here? But when your father pitches up, you know where you're going. You're going home. You're going to a place of rest. And that is what the world and what we must hear when we see our father pitch up in Jesus Christ on the earth. To do what? 
Jesus didn't patch up to be beaten by the Father. That, that distorts our understanding of re the redemptive work of Christ. That is a legalistic way of trying to explain. There's, there is a place where it is defined like that in the Bible, but that is not the view. If you look from God's point of view at salvation, what really took place. So, if, if we define sin, we define sin uh, um, basically as, um, let me define sin. The word sin means to give a portion of something or to have, have a lot or a portion assigned to somebody and he doesn't partake of it or he doesn't receive it. And that sin would basically be um, if... If I have dreamt that my son would be with me like this, this guy in Africa and his son is taken away from him, he would say, it's a sin that my son cannot live here with me. That is a sin. Sin means to miss the goal, to miss the mark, uh, not to get to the original plan or goal. That's what sin means. So when God wants to forgive sin he wants to send the system away where we are not partakers of what he has dreamt for us that's forgiveness of sins now when we are in a place now look at this we get sin defined from the father's perspective and then we get sins that we would define as swearing cussing stealing murder and those kind of things when we are in slavery we are not ourselves. And this slavery brings so much pressure on us that we will do things that we don't want to do. And you might say, Beth, you know, that is like um, you want to do blame shifting. But that's exactly what Paul did. Paul said in Romans 7, he said, that which I want to do, I don't do. And that which I don't want to do, that I do. Therefore, I conclude, it is not I who sin, but the sin in me. So Paul said, oh, well, it's not I. You know this, and what he was using there was the word concupiscence. He's talking about evil forms of lust. That's what Paul said. Paul said, when I tried, when the Bible says you shall not desire, I found all forms of concupiscence. The law, when the law said you shall not do this, I, it's like being a slave under a slave owner and the slave owner says you shall not do this. I just find inside myself I cannot do what this guy tells me to do. Maybe I want to do it because I'm going to be beaten if I don't, but I don't know why there's a power inside me that causes me not to get it right. And Paul comes to that conclusion. And when we are in slavery, we will bring forth, it will bring forth things in us that's completely contrary to a place where we are loved. We see that in normal family life every day. If you take two children, the one you love, the one you kind to, the one you speak, speak with. I mean, if I look at my children while they were in the, in, inside my wife, I would take them, I would hold her, I would just say, you know, we, I just want to tell you, I would speak to them and say, this home is your home, you are welcome here, you belong here, this is a safe place for you, I would do all of that. Imagine you do that with the one, and the other one you reject, hate, it's like borderline abortion, all those kind of things, and once a child is born, you leave him on the street. Do you want to tell me that those two kids are going to have the same quality of life? No, to the one. He's such, the situation he's in, if he goes and he's angry and he loses his temper and he's violent and those kind of things, we would say, we understand. He didn't have it easy. Now, as if we as people will not impute his trespasses against him, but against the pain and the torture he is in, we can use another example, it's even more powerful. If somebody is born blind, are you going to 
criticize him because he cannot drive? You will say, listen, man, the fact that he doesn't have the ability to drive, run, do the things a normal person do, we can understand. You know, he was born like that. He's, he's in a place where he's, where he's taken captive by, by something that's stronger than him. And God wasn't blind to the situation we are in. He knew we were deceived. Adam, or Eve was deceived. Adam went into this thing willingly and death came upon them. And when they were in the power of death, the way what they believe about God was twisted. They didn't even believe that the only one that possesses life is for them. They thought that God was against them. When God came in the cool of the day to walk with Adam, what happened to their heart? They wanted to run away. Imagine your heart is so twisted that the only one that possesses life, that has created you, that has always loved you, that you're now hiding from him. Because your mind is not full of his goodness anymore, but your own inability or nakedness. Imagine that. You are in that situation. If you're in a situation where you are afraid of the only one that can help you, and that person, if he's in his right mind, and he sees this deception and this death on this person, and he loves this person, for it is his own child. Remember the Bible says Adam was the son of God. If you take the genealogy, it ends with Adam, the son of God. So he is my child. Look at what he's take, what's happened to him. Adam didn't all of a sudden become a child of the devil. He was still a child of God. But it was God's child was lost. God's child, God's son was dying. And God said, I want to save my, my people. I want to save him. I want to bring him to a place of comfort and rest. That's what he wanted. That was God's plan for man. For God said, the original plan that I had with him, I will bring it forth. So let us just, um, just summarize this and we're going to go to the next step. We've said that salvation or forgiveness is defined in two ways. Either the slave master's way or God's way or the father's way. And we want to put the focus on the father's definition of this. For we are family. Okay. The father's definition of sin is it is a sin that my son is taken captive for in this captivity, things comes forth in his life, bitterness, hatred, resentment, and things that destroys him. So let me set him free from the, over, the overshadowing power so that his life can return back to a place where it is not murder, drunkenness, hatred, adultery, and whatever, but where it is love, peace, joy, long-suffering, kindness. Let, him bring, let me bring him in a place where my love can bring forth life inside him, so that he will not die, but live forever. That is because I want him forever. Do you know why God grants, wants to give us eternal life? It's very simple. For he doesn't want you for a short time. <laughs> you know, when we marry, we say, until death do us part. Because that is our longest definition of eternity. Now, we can only say, well, I can be married to you for 75 years. If everything goes very well. <laughs> And when we make that commitment, it's because we cannot think of a life without that person. If I think of my wife, we married 21 years now. If she must get a deadly disease or something, you know, that can take her life away from me, it will break my heart. Because I haven't married her to have... A short part of my life with her. I've married her to be married to her until Jesus comes. That's the kind of thing I have in my mind. So I would see anything that want to take her life away as the enemy. And I would want to save her from what destroys her. And that's how God feels about you. He wants you forever. He finds consolation. He finds peace. He finds comfort when he is with his people. You might say, Baptist, you're just talking God too good. This is too much grace. This is too much goodness. Listen, God became a human being. 
you must say back to you, how, how can we see God? Man, God became a human. And that human went and sat at the right hand of the Father. To be forever a human being. God will never be outside of human. In the Old Testament it says God is spirit. But that spirit incarnated human flesh and was and glorified it and sat at the right hand. To the point that Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So let us settle with it. God is comfortable inside a human. Amen. He doesn't feel that a human being um, does him any harm or stops him from giving full expression to who he really is. So if we look at the, the, the definition of forgiveness from the Father and we look at the definition of forgiveness inside the law system, we find it completely different. The one is a sin conscious one and the other one is a bondage conscious one. This one wants you to get you to stop to do sins. This one wants to set you free from what brings forth that misery and bitterness and those things in your life. So... <clears throat> If we look at the original plan that God had with us, I've shared a little bit on that, but let me just touch on that again. God is Elohim. He is, he is the Elohim is the plural for God. Those, those of you that, that hear me for the first time, El is the singular for God or Eloah. Elohim, like you would get cherub, which is one cherub. Cherubim is the plural for cherub. You get Eloah, which means God, then Elohim, which is the plural for God. The Bible says, and God, Elohim, created the heaven and the earth. And God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And then the Bible says, if you go and read Titus 1 verse 2, which is my favorite verse these days, it says that God has Paul says, in the hope, I am in the hope of eternal life, which God promised before the world began. So God said, Elohim, this is Elohim, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Since we are the only immortals possessing eternal life, let us then make this available to them. Now the only way you can have access to eternal life is by being loved until you cannot die. <laughs> that sounds difficult, but it's very practical. I can just explain it to you this way. If you don't feel loved and somebody loves you, what is it, how does it feel? You feel, I've come alive. Isn't it? This, this vitalizes me. It gives life to me. It brings joy to me. It, it brings forth, you know, I, I cannot sleep at night. Oh, I'm so loved. I'm in love. Now, the Trinity, the life they share is the highest quality of life. And this quality of life is of such a high standard that it cannot end. The best way I can explain it is with normal things in this life. If you, if you buy um, a if you buy a certain make of car, it might last 10 years. If you go and buy a very expensive one, it might last 20 years. Because why? Because of its quality. It's a higher quality. God's quality of life is one of kindness, meekness, temperance, faithfulness. A, a quality where the Father always sees the value of the Son and the Son sees, sees beauty in the Father. Where they stand open and transparent before one another. Wherein there's love for one another. The Bible says clearly the Father loved the Son. It's written. You know, we talk about relationship there. And uh, um, love is also something wherein when you love someone, it's not for no reason. I mean, the Father doesn't love the Son for no reason. The son is beautiful to him. The son is valuable to him. I mean, we don't love our kids for no reason. No, no, we love our kids for they are of us. We see ourselves in them. And that is where this love comes from. And that's how the father loves the son. And then they said, let us make someone else that is from us. You know, like you've heard that thing, God, um, God spoke to 
to the to the um, he spoke and brought forth but when he came and he brought forth man he he, he spoke to himself and he said let us bring forth he, before that he said let the let in the sea fish come forth and let from the land this come forth but when he made man he spoke to himself he said let us bring forth and when man was brought forth, he said, what we will do with this guy, we, he's got a mind, he's got a will, he's got emotions, we will love on him to the point that his belief in us, his trust in us, will cause him to have eternal life. That he will live forever on account of our goodness towards him. And when he receives this goodness, that's why the tree of life was there. Because you can go and eat of this tree. How do we eat of the tree of life? Very simple. You believe in it. Who is the tree of life? It's God. So God says, we will be here. We will love on them. And we want them to believe and trust in us. And have their heart at rest. At our integrity towards them. At our quality of life towards them. We will love them. We will saturate their minds with our thoughts. With our kindness. With our goodness. And this will be a life inside them. And it will come forth in them. And so they will live and not die. Forever. And we will be happy. Sharing life. And I'll share my whole kingdom with them. I'll share everything with them. And they will live and not die. And the biggest concern in the heart of God was to Adam. Adam, I want you forever. Don't eat of that tree, man. It will kill you. I don't have time tonight to explain on what that tree is. But we see that God has dreamt man. He's planned for man. And man came to a place where the devil uh, deceived uh, Eve and got Adam's mind to a place that this God that loves him so much he saw that God as his enemy and that's, uh, that just breaks your heart man. if you think of that when God sat with this thing and he said how I've promised them eternal life from the beginning how will I get it right to win their hearts again this is the gospel story the gospel story is not about how the father wanted to punish the son and how the son took the beating that the father wanted to lay on Adam. And now, after the son took this, you know, it only lasts for a while because the father will come back again one day and then he's going to do a final beating. <laughs> you know? And he's going to pour out tribulation, he's going to pour out this, and he's going to just destroy, and he's going to smoke and fire. And I will tell you, man, my heart cannot believe in such an angry person. We even see if somebody in South Africa, we would see that um, if so, I mean, we've got a lot of crime and stuff, and when we see somebody steal somebody else's car, and that guy starts to, and he's upset about the car, and we can see it's difficult for him. He doesn't have a car now, and he must wait for the insurance to pay out, and it's like the whole thing. We've got a compassion. But when we see that he walks in a continual bitterness towards someone else, we understand that. But it's, it makes relationship very difficult, because he's walking in that thing. It's, it's captivated his mind. And what you would want to do is you want your friend to be free from that. You want to bring something forth that can set him free. And the very same thing with God. He wants to set us free. And, and he wants to restore our faith. He wants to win our hearts. So the gospel is not the story of how God punished Jesus to have peace. The gospel is a story of how God, through Jesus, came to restore faith in the hearts of man towards God that they can be saved. It would be the story of how the slave started to believe that the slave owner is his real father. Or if we take it one step further, let's take grandchildren, where the grandchildren thought that the slave owner is their father, but where the grandfather comes to win the heart of the grandchild to the point that the grandchild can actually believe you are my grandfather and I have a home I've got another country where I live, where I come from, I belong in another place, this is not my life. And the only way he could come and do that, the only way Jesus could come and do that, was to incarnate himself into all the misery and cursed life that, wa that we were in. That's why he came and he, he was born of a virgin. Very important. He, he, he didn't have his own sin. So when he came into this earth, 
and he hang, was hanging upon a tree. He, 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 he was seen as the cursed. He was seen as what we would see a slave smitten of God. You know, just cursed. The worst. That's where we were. That's where we defined ourselves. Man defined himself as God doesn't love me. I'm cursed of God. That's why I'm suffering like this. I'm going through all these things. And the worst thing that can happen to you is death. And here we see a man that didn't have his own sin. He came and incarnated our sin, our darkness. He became sin. He ha was hanging upon that cross and the Father made him a promise. And he said, I promise you eternal life. So here we can see God said, how will I win the hearts of man? How will I get man to believe that I'm for them? How will I tell man that my promise has never changed? How will I tell man that I've always loved them? Let me become a man. I will create a man. I'll bring forth a man again in the earth that will represent all people. He will take the sin of all people upon him. I will promise him what I've promised man from the beginning, eternal life. And then he will show to every man upon the cross that he, he represents all of us. Cursed sin, carrying my sin. Okay? Man even spat on him. Man came and hated him and everything. He was hanging there, yet he had one thing. The Father promised me eternal life. I am sin, but I've got a promise. I'm his son. And he promised me eternal life, although I am sin. I'm not even going to try and save my life. Because I've got a promise from the Father. And the Father's heart has never changed. The day I was born in Mary. The day I was baptized by John, the heavens opened. And now that I've got all the sin on me, the Father's heart has never changed. He loves me. And I know that I will allow this death to come on me until... until the final breath. I will die here. But I've got a promise. My father's love for me. And Jesus didn't hang there having his son. He hanged there having your life. Your death was there. Showing to you your promise from the father. And he died. And on the third day, God showed his faithfulness towards a man who became sin. Your sin. And he raised him from the dead so that we can look at this picture and our faith in God can be restored. Through that. That's why blood was needed. That's why it was so important to see a death and the final curse in a man. That's why I believe there's no salvation without Jesus. Because how will our hearts be restored to trust in the Father fully that he can bring us to the end goal that he had? And this might be shocking to you, but I want to tell you, the end goal God had with man was not you in heaven. We've preached heaven too much. And we haven't preached the resurrected Jesus. If it was just a heaven thing, then Jesus could have died and gone to heaven. Hallelujah. But that was not a heaven thing. The plan of God with man was to have a man created from the dust of the earth and grant him eternal, immortal life by loving him and being faithful towards him. That's what we see in Jesus. We see the Father loving the Son, even though he had all sin, showing his love, showing his faithfulness. You might say, but the Bible says, you know, the Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just go and read where that comes from. He's quoting Psalm 22. And he's just reciting that psalm. And that's what they could hear. If, he, if they heard that, they would have, those Jews would have known the whole psalm off by heart, which talks about how he will deliver him from death. That's what it talks about. It was just quoting Psalm 22. It was, the Father never left Jesus. Never. For he's never left us. Never. We've been deceived. We've believed the lie. And this is why the whole thing, I believe it's impossible to be saved without faith. Some people say, Bert, the teaching you teach is just universalism, everybody's saved, whatever. No, it's the restoration of faith. 
Now we can have the original persuasion that God had. And now through faith, I mean, the only way something can really enter your heart is if you trust. You know how my wife entered my heart? By loving me. And that's how I entered her heart. You know, we got married and then after many years of being married, we really found what it is to become one. Because we got married and we felt no heart, we love each other, you know, I'm a radical preacher and she likes a, this radical guy and whatever, and she's very pretty and sexy to me, you know, and she's, she's just what I dreamt, you know, and hallelujah. <laughs> and that's where the story starts. And then time gone on and I saw how she went with me to Malawi and where we preached at the lake there and where we had some Muslims that wanted to stone us and how she stood in faith, you know, standing with me, not running away. And she was standing there with my son in her arms, protecting him. And she stood with me in this gospel. I remember how, how we were in the Zambia bush and we were eight hours from the closest hospital in the middle of nowhere. No telephones, nothing there. It's, there, was one, there was one phone in a little town there and you get there, they make a call and then they just say, we're sorry, it doesn't work. It's just the way it is. And she had a miscarriage and almost died. And just how she stood with me and all that. I saw how she protected me when people persecuted me, slandered my name, and how she believed in me. And as I saw all of that, you know what? My heart started to trust her. I've always trusted her, but as this happened, it was as if your heart just opens up. And as I find this trust in her, I found an amazing thing took place. I found that she was born in me. I started to think like her. I started to like the art she likes. I like the food she likes. I like the things she likes. I, I find I, I think like her because my heart has started, my heart has trusted her. And in the very same way, from her side towards me, she has seen how I have provided and given and cared for in the most difficult situations. And she's trusted me. And so who I am is born inside her. And now when I stand in front of something beautiful that I know she, she would like, then I can value that and I can actually say, before I knew her, this wasn't even beautiful to me. But now this is so beautiful. What I'm actually feeling is I'm feeling her living inside me. And that is God's plan for you. <laughs> and that's why faith is so important. That is why he had to restore the lie that was told. The lie that was told is, God says, you will die if you eat of this, but it's a lie. He's lying to you. He knows you can also be like him by this. He's got hidden motives. He's hiding things from you. And man's trust was broken came to restore trust and he said listen even in the midst of all your sins my original plan has never changed let me show it practically to you here you are the fullness of sin the fullness of death and i promise that person eternal life that's my promise to mankind and as we see him raised from the dead we can conclude that it wasn't his sin there it was me and when he was raised it means the life I behold in the resurrection is also not his life, it's my life. So I can say, faith is restored in the Father. And we see the word of life. What did Jesus promise? What did the Father promise? I will give immortality to man. And what did he do? He made Jesus immortal. In a physical human body, after becoming the son of the world. And that's God's promise to you. And that restores faith in our hearts in God and as we can believe and trust in what has happened there and we see the death of the old man we see the new man there and belief enters our heart you know what we find we find 
I am now born from his love for me. It's called born again. I'm not born from legalism or law or Judaism or any of those things. I'm now born from the Father's love for me. Glory to God. And from there, we start to reason and think about life and live with God. So thank God for Jesus. Thank God that He was willing to go all through all of that. That's why we love Him. Because we see His commitment towards us. We see how He was willing to take the pain and the curse to show us the original word of the Father that has never changed. Mm, isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. So now, when this God comes and stand on bended knee before us, because that's what He did in Christ. He bent down, He stooped down, stand on bended knee, and He blesses us. He speaks well of us. He says, this is my word for you. You are mine. I love you. As we see this God on bended knee standing and say, listen, man, I've always loved you. I will always love you. Will you marry me? Sin can be defined in saying no. That would be a sin. <laughs> sin is not defined in losing your temper. Sin is defined in saying no to that. And saying no to that will destroy you. Because we have not been made to function and live outside of such love. We don't love and be saved by how we love. We are the recipients of love. And His love for us saves us. And from being saved from death, we find love flow from us. Glory to God. Amen. Man, I think I've said what I want to say. Can we pray together?